You're listening to the Telltale Channel. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, don't forget to check out my Patreon. And take a look at my other YouTube channels too. You can find some ad-free, uncensored, complete versions of my videos on my website, owenmorgan.com. And while you're there, don't forget to sign up for my email list to get early access to everything I release. All links are in the description. In this podcast, a West Virginia state representative recently talked about evolution and how fake it is. There are a crazy number of state representatives going absolutely nuts right now. Mike Lindell has a new court filing to announce, supposedly. He says he's about to release evidence to the world? Well, the evidence is apparently released, and surprise, surprise, it's meaningless! I found a clip of Kenneth Copeland all the way back from the 1970s saying everybody believed he was a scam artist. Everybody he knew thought that he was scamming his congregation because they knew that he was a scumbag before. And when they found out he had this evangelical ministry or whatever, they tried to like alert the members of the ministry. It's hilarious. 1970. I've got the clip because I went through the entire thing beginning to end. Let's talk talk about it and we'll talk about some of his more notorious scams if you want to leave a voicemail the number is 1-800-701-8573 if you want to send me a message instead owenmorgan.com and then hit the contact me button in the menu also check out my book owenmorgan.com slash book i would appreciate that very much i'm trying to get this book released i'm super excited for it i'm excited for people to see it excited for it to finally be out so doing my best with it Evolution's been taught in science class for how long now? And that's a quickly dying theory that many, many understand to be uh, an absurdity. Many, many understand to be an absurdity. This is Senator Azinger, Republican, of course, from uh, West Virginia, as it turns out. And he's got a lot to say. Oh, my God. You think the evolution thing was bad? Oh, just wait. He's got so much crazy stuff to lay down for us. I want to listen to like his whole breakdown of everything he said here. Yeah, I think it's like a minute and a half long or something. And then I want to talk about some other absolutely psychotic state level representatives. If you're unfamiliar how it works, yeah, we have federal representatives. We've got Lauren Bobert and we've got, uh, you know, Adam Schiff and... Nancy Pelosi and all these other people, those are federal level, but we have uh, the same structure on a state level, one, one level down. They operate in a very similar way. And there are a ton of really, really weird people in uh, the state houses. So let's listen to Senator Azinger, Republican, state level senator in West Virginia, 3rd District, Talk about evolution, abortion, and a whole bunch of other wild stuff. By the way, this clip came out late February 2024. Um, all of a sudden, we have a lot of senators who are uh, all upset and worried about accuracies in science class. I think. Mm, yeah, I think people should be concerned about accuracies in science class. Sure. Go on. Class. I think it was the senator from Taylor who mentioned that, hey, look, evolution's been taught in science class for how long now? And that's a quickly dying theory that many, many understand to be uh, an absurdity in and of itself. Okay, many, many? Who is many, many? Are you going to give us some, some names on that? Those are called weasel words, by the way, if you are unfamiliar, where he's just hand-waving to some ambiguous authority. Many people say, okay, who? Which ones? Name them. Tell me which scientists you're referring to here. The answer is nobody. So nobody claims that evolution is a dying theory. Go on. Just because it can't pass the first test of first cause. Can't pass the first test of the first cause. What do you mean by that? First cause. Uh, does he realize that abiogenesis and evolution are not the same thing? Is he aware of that fact? Abiogenesis, the study of how life came to be, how life appeared on the planet and started to grow in the first place. Evolution is the study of how life changes over time. Or honestly, how a lot of things change over time. It's not just life. Things 
change and morph and modify and warp and and becomes the thing that it needs to be to fill its role properly. You know, I knew somebody who used to keep their iPhone in their back pocket. Uh, people probably heard stories similar to this. Their iPhone slowly kind of bent a little bit upward. You know, it's kind of like a curve, not a strong curve, but just a little bit. And the glass, of course, stays straight, but the metal kind of bends a little bit. That is what is happening effectively with evolution. Things are trying to fit into their environment to more correctly adapt, to uh, to better adapt to what's happening around them. I don't know what he's going on about this first cause thing, and he doesn't either, I'm sure. So this is a, this is a great bill. Um, it shows conception. And I'm concerned. And um, Google it. At the very nanosecond of conception, there's a flash of light. When conception occurs in human beings, I believe it's across the whole animal kingdom, at the point, the second of conception, there's a flash of light. That's God telling us, I believe, that life begins there. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, well, I looked up what he was talking about here, this flash of light thing. And as it turns out, it's true. I checked this out. Look, watch. This is the moment of conception, the moment an egg cell becomes an embryo officially. Watch. Flash of light. It's, uh, and then it, it recedes. It's real fast, and it, it, it ends like just like that. I understand that the reason that it happens is because zinc is released, and my guess, I, this is just me talking, don't trust this at all, my guess is there's probably a flash of light because there's a very, very, very minor explosive reaction because zinc doesn't react very well when in the presence of water, I believe. It's like a Coulomb reaction right the point is that like there are all kinds of incredible amazing things about everything about the human body about uh, nature about all of it it's incredible it doesn't mean that it didn't evolve well let's put it this way it doesn't mean that evolution isn't the way that god got there and also god explicitly endorsed abortion numbers 5 11 to 23 he explicitly said if you think your wife has cheated on you, you should go to the priest who will then perform an abortion. This whole idea uh, that is pushed by like these evangelical nutcases, these Christian nationalists, this idea that God is pro-life, completely abiblical, completely ahistorical. This is not what the Bible said whatsoever. And uh, yeah, this flash of light, what, like literally the soul entering the body or whatever. I've, I've seen a whole bunch of bizarre comments about it like what what the hell are you talking about it's just zinc being released and and having a reaction with the system around it but whatever okay sure it, there are so many bizarre state level representatives out there it's not just this dude from west virginia senator azinger dusty devers is making massive waves right now. He's a Republican, District 32. He's a House member, I think. And he's from Oklahoma, who is, by the way, if you haven't been following, turning out nutcase after nutcase right now. Dusty Devers is only the latest in a long line of nutcases from Oklahoma. Before we continue, I want to talk about Dusty Devers and the crazy stuff that he said, but I don't want you guys to like lose hope in anything, okay? Yes, there are state-level representatives that are complete nutcases. They're losing. They're losing. The Republican position is a traditionalist position. It's a conservative position. They want to conserve the past. They want to resist change at all costs. And that's just a losing position. That's just what it is. It's always been a losing position. It will always be a losing position because society changes, it progresses, it builds, it grows, it changes. That's just how it works. So how do these 
state level representatives or, or the uh, Republican Party in general, how do they react to that fact? Outrage. They react with outrage. They get everybody whipped into a blood frenzy over something, some specific thing. It was CRT for a while, then it was wokeism, and then it was, you know, it's always had something to do with black people or trans people or gay people or some other minority group, uh, Mexicans, immigrants, anybody that they can target and blame for their problems, they'll do it. Rep the Re Republican Party, the official of, uh, I'm sorry, the officials in the Republican Party is who I'm talking about when I say they. I'm talking Dusty Devers. I mean, state level and federal level Republican representatives and Republican media like Fox News. They'll demonize anybody they can. Now, that's pretty much the only card that they have. They cannot resist change forever. It is going to happen. While we've got nutcases out here like uh, Dusty Devers, who we'll listen to in a minute, or like the last guy who's saying evolution is a dying theory. When we got nutcases in Congress saying that. Or even crazier, dude who ran for governor of Pennsylvania got 40% of the vote in 2022. Almost won. Doug Mastriano. This is uh, early October 2022, right before the voting took place. Mastriano is doing a campaign event. He comes out here and he says this. On day one, the sexualization of our kids, pole dancing, and all this other crap that's going on will be forbidden in our schools. Pole dancing in schools. He thinks pole dancing is happening in schools. He doesn't really think that, does he? This is just the outrage machine churning away, isn't it? On day one, all the graphic pornographic books that are in elementary schools will be, will be pulled out. Like there's an XXX section with a curtain there where kids who are over six can walk in the back and pick out which movie they want. It's ridiculous, dude. Anyway, the point is that these people are resisting change and their only weapon is outrage. And they can only keep people outraged over one subject at a time, really. I mean, they can go off in these little directions, but it splits their focus. It splits the outrage. So right now, they are laser-focused on the border. And immigrants and Mexicans and drug cartels. Blah, 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 blah. When they're focused on one subject, you know what they're not doing? They're not talking about CRT. They're not talking about Black Lives Matter being a terrorist organization or whatever other thing. They're not talking about all of the nonsense that they say about the black community. And the black community makes progress. They move forward. Their issues are not as politicized as they were previously. They win court battles. They progress. They, uh, the gay community progresses. The trans community progresses. Every time there's focus on another group, every other group progresses. Women didn't have the right to own credit cards or have mortgages in the 1970s. Yes, the 1970s. Your mom probably wasn't allowed to have a credit card. And look where we are now. Having a, a woman as a president is not out of the question. In fact, it's not even a question. Yeah, of course, we could have a woman as a president. We just haven't yet. Every time these people laser focus on a subject, they forget about the others. And people donate to these organizations, the NAACP, the ACLU, and the secular causes, American Atheists, FFRF, they, they, they donate to these organizations and we get wins until they shift focus to something new. They're doing, you know, every time there's been a lack of progress in society. Every time there's been attempted progress in society, there's the church standing in the way, waiting for it and preventing it from happening at any cost. And here we sit again, watching it all play over again, like a movie. Anyway, the point here is you don't need to worry about these people. Yeah, they're nutcases. Yeah, they're trying to take over the government. That's true. And we need to vote like our lives depend on it because somebody's life does. Your vote could save somebody's life in all seriousness, really. Crawl over broken glass to vote for your representatives because you know 
the people who vote for Dusty Devers will be doing that. They will do whatever it takes to vote for him. You need to be just as fervent and serious about voting. It's a civic duty. It should be mandatory, in my opinion. But anyway, that's another story. The point is, don't be too discouraged by, but by what these people say. Yeah, they say crazy stuff. Don't feel down about it. They're losing. They're freaking out because they're losing. So when you see people freaking out like this, going down an absolutely bizarre rabbit hole, oh, we want to ban no-fault divorce now, we want to ban birth control or condoms now or whatever, guess who's moving forward while they're saying all this ridiculous nonsense that nobody wants? The black community is moving forward. The gay community is moving forward. It's a struggle. We have to fight every day. We have to donate. We have to work at it. We have to volunteer. But we're making progress every single day. And they're losing. Society will progress, whether they like that fact or not. Anyway, with that in mind, let's listen to Dusty Deepers here. The government doesn't make the law. The people rise up, power rises up from the people, and the people make the law. And that law should be in accordance with God's word and the conscience. And this... And the conscience. Well, here's the deal, Dusty. I don't know who's God's word to follow. Which one should I trust? Should I trust your interpretation should I trust Martin Luther King Jr.'s interpretation? Should I trust Kenneth Copeland's interpretation? Whose interpretation? My pastor's interpretation? Whose? There is a verse to justify anything, any moral position in the Bible. 32,000 verses, 66 books total, 27 in the New Testament, four of which were primarily narratives about Jesus' life. There is not a single moral position in the Bible that isn't practically, at least, reversed a chapter later. So I don't want to hear any of this nonsense about, oh, it should be based on the Bible. Literally anything that we do is based on the Bible. You want a biblical justification for you as a religious zealot to stay the f*** out of government? Let me give you your biblical justification. I I don't have my Bible on me. Romans 13. Romans chapter 13. The government is there because God put them in their place, for better or worse. Focus on the kingdom of God. Focus on winning souls. Focus on bringing people to Jesus. Don't worry about the government and what they're up to. Direct contradiction to what Dusty Devers is saying here. But okay, so basically he's saying, the point of the clip is, if laws are passed that contradict his interpretation of what the Bible says, then those laws should be ignored. That's effectively what he's saying here. Just step back a little, keep listening. People and the people make the law and that law should be in accordance with God's word and the conscience and this, these, and the conscience. I, I don't know what that means. These federal laws are restricting both of those things. And so when this authority, the wait, federal laws restrict both the conscience and God's word? What? I don't have any clue what he's even talking about. Restricting both of those things. And so when this authority, namely the federal government, uh, commands what God's forbid, God has forbidden or has not required. For, second, whenever it forbids what God commands or has not forbidden. Third, whenever it oversteps its constitutional jurisdiction. Or fourth, binds the conscience that God alone has jurisdiction. We, those who are under who are their authority we are the authority for the federal government right so we are the authority for the federal government he's not talking about himself as a state senator he isn't a representative for the federal government he's talking about himself as a christian nationalist he who is a christian nationalist is in authority of the federal government he has given himself authority of the federal government that's psychotic get Help, Dusty. So Christian nationalists, effectively, is what he's saying. Go on. Are the authority for the federal government uh, in this situation. We are not to obey them whenever they take tyrannical action. And tyrannical action is defined by anything that Dusty Devers doesn't like. Anything that he thinks is wrong. That means adult entertainment. That means no-fault divorce. I have him on 
recording saying all of this stuff. I could play every single one if you want. Uh, that means birth control. That means um, abortion to any degree, no matter what, at any point. So you're 15 weeks along and you find out that there's no head and the birth process is going to end in your death and the death of the fetus. And th there's no way around it. That's okay. God's will. Let it happen. That's his view. For real. Sometimes they twist things around and they gerrymander and they mess around with the political structure enough to get themselves into a position of power. By the way, they Republicans, by and large, are extremely unpopular in the United States. Democrats make up a vast majority of voters in the United States, but that's neither here nor there. They weasel their way into positions of authority by gerrymandering, splitting up districts and making them look like a ridiculous maze or something like that so that they will win a district, like Dusty Devers, for example. When he gets in, he gets enough authority that he has the ability to reverse Roe v. Wade. You know, the Supreme Court, they reversed Roe v. Wade. And Casey, I think, as well, maybe. Thus, effectively banning abortion for all intents and purposes. And he gets massive backlash from everybody. Nobody, practically, in the country wants abortion outlawed to the degree that Dusty Devers mistakenly believes that God wants abortion outlawed. Numbers 5, 11 to 23 pretty clearly outlines that God likes abortion, wants it to happen, thinks it's a good thing in some cases. Anyway, doesn't matter how far along you are, by the way. If your wife cheated on you, you should, you should get an abortion, in, according to the Bible. I'm just quoting the Bible here, okay? Like, I don't know what it is with state representatives right now, but we've really got to keep an eye on these people, okay? And uh, by the way, look, I know that it's like a Christian thing to stick your hand up in like a Hitler salute-esque type of thing, but please don't do that. Find another way to praise Jesus. Find a different salute for Jesus other than the Hitler one, please. Yeah, check out this other clip from Dusty Devers. This is mid-March 2024. Jesus, your warrior king, has summoned you. He has commanded your formation for battle. So he's telling uh, people, he's telling Christian men, it's time to form a militia and fight. Line up, men. Your charge is to fight the king's battle with the king's weapons, to fight on his battlefront, to make offensive war on the gates of hell, and to prevail, to push the lines ever forward to extend the dynasty and the dominion of our king who rules from on high. And he used the word dominion there for a very specific reason. Seven mountains dominionism. And every enemy will bow. Amen. He will footstool every enemy and this world will, will be dominionized and it will glow. There it is again, dominionized. Catch that? Will glory reflect like the waters cover the sea? The world will be conquered and the conquerors will sit with King Jesus on his throne. Amen. Amen. Men, it is no time for shrinking back. Know this, you will suffer. You will be called to share in the sufferings of our King, but they cannot be compared to the eternal weight of glory that is to be revealed to you. In your groaning, you will grow. In your mourning, you will hope. In your struggle, you will triumph. So That is psychotic. Seriously, all the yelling, all the pounding, and all of the pointing and all that stuff sounds like a Hitler speech. No joke. He's calling people to war right now. Very clearly, right? will triumph. So keep your eyes on our loving, crucified, but resurrected warrior king, Jesus. Yeah, all right. Look, I have the document, Biblical Basis for War, somewhere. It's a PDF. Uh, and it's a PDF written by a House representative, I think, in Washington, Spokane, Washington. It's absolutely psychotic. It's like 10 pages long or something. And it describes the Christian nation that he wants to build and the reasons why they go to war. Just take a look at just like one page here. This is on... Um, pajiba.com I'm, I'm unfamiliar but like i've read the book on stream before i have the book so this is one of the pages 
10 rules of war. A, conduct a census of all able-bodied males, 18 to 45. Identify exemptions, see above. Appoint captains of 10s, 50s, 100s, and 1,000s. Avoid bloodshed if possible. Make an offer of peace before declaring war. The offer of peace is complete capit uh, capitulation. If you agree to what, uh, what we want, which is a Christian government, then we won't kill you. That's the offer of peace. It is not a negotiation or compromise of righteousness, in his words here, it says. Must surrender on terms of justice and righteousness. Stop all abortions. No same-sex marriage. No idolatry or occultism. No communism. And must be obey a biblical law. That's weird. I don't remember communism being in the Bible as evil, but okay. And um, biblical law, wasn't uh, the Mosaic law like undone by Jesus when he came around? That's why we eat shellfish today. That's why we eat crab or like shrimp or whatever. Why would we follow the Mosaic law? It's meaningless. Even the Ten Commandments, completely meaningless to us today, to Christians. If they yield, they must pay share of work or taxes. If they do not yield, kill all the males. War is not waged against nations, but against man. No scorched earth or Sherman's march to the sea. Cut down only non-food trees necessary for supplies. Safeguard production over politics or retribution. This guy really thought it out, like a lot. Do not attack or kill productive citizens. They are your base of support after the enemy is defeated. Law of booty. Law of booty. Sounds like my kind of law, okay? Number one, one half of the booty goes to those who fought. One half goes to those who didn't. Divide evenly to the individuals. Each gives tribute to the Lord. One, ties to the church and ministry. Two, none to the government. It removes a temptation to fight. This is psychotic. This is straight up psychotic shit right here, for real. Get help, people. That That's the kind of stuff that Dusty Devers is down for. I... He didn't write that manifesto. I don't know if he's even familiar with Matt Shea. But, um, yeah, that's it. I mean, that's the biblical basis for war, the manifesto. I don't know what's going on with state representatives, but, my God, dude, they are going off the rails hard. You need to vote. Get out there and vote for real. Get these people out. No more gerrymandering. Don't let them get away with this anymore. They're not popular. Nobody really wanted abortion banned in all cases, everybody wanted exceptions or certain months or whatever. Well, people like this guy here or Dusty Devers or whoever else, they want it banned. I mean, banned, banned, even though the Bible endorses it. It's psychotic. I mean, like I said, don't feel too down about it. Conservatism or traditionalism, it's a losing position. They're going to lose. And while they're whipping people into a blood frenzy over this stupid thing over here, we're making progress elsewhere. So don't sweat it. Just vote. Do your best. Don't worry about the rest. That's what I always say. Tell me what you think about it in the comments. Next up, Mike Lindell has a new court filing to announce, supposedly. He says he's about to release evidence to the world. Well, the evidence is apparently released, and surprise, surprise, it's meaningless. We'll be right back. Don't forget to check out my Patreon, and check out my website and email list for early access to uncensored, ad-free, complete videos. All links are in the description. What we're putting in that case is evidence no one has ever seen or even heard about, and it's going to be so explosive. We need to save our country now and secure our election platforms. I'm so excited. We'll see you next, next Friday, right out in front of the Supreme Court. God bless. Okay, so that's Mike Lindell. He claims he has some new revolutionary evidence that he's uh, he's going to show up to the Supreme Court, to the steps of the Supreme Court. This already happened, by the way. And he's going to present it to them and ask them to fast track it because the election is right around the corner. And that just does not sound right to me. Now, the new evidence that he claims to be filing doesn't seem to be public. Usually lawsuits are public. And lawsuits just don't work that way anyway to my knowledge, which we'll talk about in a second. But that's the claim. Lindell claims to have the evidence. Now, worst case scenario, assuming that his 
no explosive evidence blows the lid off of everything and changes all of it, everything. Worst case scenario, people have to hand count all of the ballots and we can't use counting machines or like um, digital ballot readers, basically. That's worst case scenario. So he's accomplishing basically nothing with this. But l let's just like hear from my wife real quick. She's going to kind of explain like why this is absurd. Lindell claimed to have, uh, she's off camera, so I'm going to be talking to her. Lindell claimed to have digitally filed paperwork to the Supreme Court, uh, I mean, federal Supreme Court, the other day. And this case is going to be fast tracked, hopefully, to happen before like the election happens. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Like, is that how it works? What the hell is happening here? So a couple things. Um, first, I am not a lawyer. I'm just a law student who's like two days away from total burnout. So, you, you know, take everything I say with like 15 grains of salt. and none Little, of <laughs> little shorter than uh, two yeah. days away. But OK. <laughs> And second of all, anyone can have explosive evidence if they just make it up. And that's what he did here. So when it comes to the Supreme Court, there, there's something that we should cover first so y'all have a full understanding of what's going on. Um, to do that, we're going to visit one of the first-year law students' worst nightmares, uh, civil procedure. So with civil procedure, there's something called subject matter jurisdiction and that basically means for each court what is the type of case they can hear what's the subjects they can uh, decide on and when it comes to the supreme court there it's very very limited you can either have original jurisdiction meaning that you are able to hear the case before anyone else you're like the trial court you are the one who is making the very first decision. You probably recognize it from like Law and Order SVU. That's the court that they go to for the first conviction. And with civil procedure, if you want the Supreme Court to have original jurisdiction, there's very, very few ways that comes up. First, it comes up if two states are suing each other. So for example, Nebraska was suing Colorado at one point because Nebraska got really, really butthurt that Colorado legalized weed. That would have been within the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction. A couple other things that can come underneath that. You have admiralty law, which y'all are probably most familiar with when it comes to sovereign citizens. It is a real thing. It's not what they say. It's any, basically any case that comes up in federal waters. Um, maritime law, essentially. And the third case is when it comes to official federal employees like ambassadors, people who it would be a major issue for the United States if a single state was ruling on the legality of an ambassador's actions. And so the Supreme Court has the original jurisdiction. What they also have, and what y'all are probably most familiar with, is appellate jurisdiction. That means that a court makes it through the trial court, or a case makes it through the trial court. Which is like the first level court, is that right? Right. Okay. And then they appeal to an appellate court. That's your district courts. Um, and if a case makes it past there, then they can appeal to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court can make decisions as an appellate court when it comes to things like federal law, constitutional law. And in this case with Mike Lindell, what he wants you to think is that they'll have some kind of jurisdiction over this because it implicates voting rights and voting laws. So it, I guess uh, what he's claiming here is that he, well, originally he claimed in one of the videos we're going to watch, he claimed that he, he was going to stand on the, the steps of the courthouse and filed the case right then and there. But he said for security reasons, he filed it electronically. Do you think that there's any truth to that? Is there any way that he actually filed a case with the Supreme Court directly? Is there any way for that to happen? Or In my official law student opinion, the man's talking out his butthole. 
you don't file with the Supreme Court in that way. It's not the same as you want to file for an, a div- for a divorce, and so you file papers with the county clerk. Right. It's it's really just like the the end of the line in appeals, basically, right? And the Supreme Court picks the cases that they want to pick up, right? Right. And with that process, we'll go into it a, a little bit more. What you will commonly hear it as is asking the court to grant cert. Now, it's that's short for a Latin word, which I'm probably going to mispronounce, called certiorari. When you have an appeal and it doesn't go your way, you can ask the court to grant cert. They'll review it, and 99% of the time, they're going to deny it. The Supreme Court doesn't hear many cases at all. So there's honestly no way that what Mike Lindell's talking about, even in good faith, let's say he made it all the way through the appellate process, there's no way the Supreme Court would pick this up. Right. So um, that's like the best good faith interpretation, that he went through the whole trial process from beginning to end and it in, is now appealing to the Supreme Court to pick up this case, which means this evidence is already available publicly because it's part of a lawsuit, right? We would be able to view this evidence before this exact moment. Like he said that this is going to be released when he files mm-hmm. with the Supreme Court on Thursday or Friday or whatever. So there's no way that's true. N- no. Um, so, Almost certainly not, right. with very few exceptions, I guess. It, you don't really see, when it comes to reading cases publicly, uh, you don't really see the full evidence. You see the documents that were filed. Law, law students and lawyers have access to special databases that allow them to reel that to read that almost in real time. It's called Westlaw, is that right? That's one of them. Um, there's also Lexis, and there's a couple others. They're very expensive, too, I mm-hmm. understand. It's like by search. It's crazy expensive. So you you would go onto one of those sites, and you would look at what the trial court and the appellate court already wrote, what kind of briefs were filed. So you don't see the specific evidence, but you would see evidence that the case existed okay now as far as i can tell up to this very moment this case did not exist so i just want to like read a little bit of this article and maybe get some of your feedback on it okay i'm just gonna go through some of this article so i i just want to like read a little bit of some of these articles we've got three actually it's mike lindell's lawyer reveals new supreme court evidence that's on newsweek actually these are all three from newsweek Mike Lindell teases explosive evidence before Supreme Court, and Mike Lindell wants Supreme Court to fast-track his case. We'll look at the newest one first. I suppose this is March 16th, 2024. Mike Lindell's lawyer reveals new Supreme Court evidence. Mike Lindell's lead counsel on Friday discussed the new evidence, quote-unquote, he is hoping to put before the Supreme Court in a bid to persuade it to rule that the use of electronic voting system to cast or tabulate votes is unconstitutional. Uh, So maybe he's giving evidence for an already existing case? Is that possible or no? Probably not. As far as I'm aware, there was one case that he was involved in with Carrie Lake, and in that they were trying to allege that electronic voting was a scam, essentially. And they tried to say, well... Just because we don't have evidence that it was hacked doesn't mean it couldn't be hacked. And every court they tried to bring that up and laughed them out, essentially. So, yeah, there's there might be a case like that, but not this. This isn't like the specific one that he's bringing up where, oh, yeah, I just jumped straight to the Supreme Court because unless you're in admiralty law or you're an ambassador or something, you're not going to do that. Okay, so the article goes on to say Lindell, the MyPillow CEO and prominent Donald Trump backer, is teaming up for the case with Arizona Republican Carrie Lake. There you go. Who has said her 2022 defeat in the state's gubernatorial election, that means governor election, was marred by fraud. To my knowledge, she didn't even admit defeat. She still claims to be the real governor, just like Trump claims to be the real president. Lake's allegations have already been repeatedly rejected in the courts. 
I understand that um, if something starts on a state level, then it stays on the state level by and large, right? So um, Carrie Lake filed her lawsuits in Arizona state court and appealed all the way to Arizona Supreme Court, right? And then, but she can't go to the Supreme Court except, except special circumstances. It depends. Um, you know, I'm learning that that's the favorite answer for everyone in the legal field. So they could theoretically apply, or they could ask the court to grant cert about a specific question when it comes to voting. We saw that in North Carolina just recently when they were asking about. I believe it was whether they could redistrict. So you can do that, but usually when it comes to state law specifically, the Supreme Court will defer because there is a balance of powers, federal and state, and you don't want, or I mean, a lot of people don't want the federal government to be able to tell states specifically what they should and should not be doing with processes that they're specifically allowed to manage such as voting within the state itself okay now just reading into the article a little bit more kind of reveals what the you know it, it reveals a question that we were wondering here this week lindell's team issued a filing to the supreme court seeking to revive a 2022 lawsuit dismissed by judges as frivolous at the time it came from Carrie Lake and failed Arizona Secretary of State candidate Mark Fincham challenging the use of electronic voting systems. Okay, that so that that makes a little more sense. So there is an already existing case, it seems, and he's trying to present evidence to revive the case. Yeah, and the, I, I know the word frivolous doesn't really strike fear into most people, but when it comes to judges that's about as bad as you can get. That usually comes with a major fine, basically saying, how dare you waste our time? How dare you wa waste taxpayer money? You not only should this case not be heard, you should be punished for even making us hear about the case to begin with. Yeah, I think uh, Donald Trump had to pay like a massive fine for bringing a case against Hillary Clinton at some point or something because it was just ridiculous nonsense. And that's because the courts don't want to be used as someone's like political tool. They don't want to be used as hammer, a weapon against somebody. They're there to decide real cases, not to deal with what whatever is going on here. Yeah, that makes sense. Continuing the article, it says Lake and Fincham's petition read, this is the original 2022 case, I guess. Newly uncovered evidence also shows Arizona's Maricopa County flagrantly violated state law for electronic voting systems. Oh, my God, people, including using altered software not certified for use in Arizona and actively misrepresented it and concealed those violations. Just absurd. Speaking on Steve Bannon's War Room podcast, Fincham said... He had three pieces of concrete evidence that's new that was not known before. Now, do we have access to that evidence? Of course we don't have access to that evidence. He claims to have filed this evidence with the Supreme Court. What was it like on the 14th or something like that? Or I mean, this article's on the 16th. And we still like have no idea like what he was even talking about or what he filed or anything at all. We're just like in the dark with this. It's a joke. Let's take a look at the uh, the other article. This is from the 15th, the day before. Mike Lindell wants Supreme Court to fast track his case. Mike Lindell wants the U.S. Supreme Court to fast track his case challenging the use of electronic tabulation systems in elections to ensure his concerns are heard before the November presidential vote. I mean, it was already dismissed as frivolous. It seems to me like it's simply not happening, right? And even if it did happen, there's no like um, negative repercussion for anybody. Honestly, it, it would just make every it would make the process way, way longer and more complex, and it, everything be have, would have to be hand counted, and it would be less accurate, and it'd take more time, and all of that other junk. Do you have any thoughts? Well, that's what they want is less accuracy. We've been seeing conservatives attack voting rights and who can vote for decades. So they, of course, they would want anything that could possibly favor them. Ultimately, though, with the Supreme Court, even one as 
obviously biased, and I'm being generous with that term, as the one we have currently, they still don't nece- they still don't really want to be seen as a political weapon. They still want to maintain some level of legitimacy. It's which is shot to sh- at this point. There's zero legitimacy left, and they know there isn't, right? <laughs> right. And so they're either going so more than likely what they're gonna do is not even respond to this because they don't want to they they have other things to worry about other rights they want to take away this is not on their agenda as far as i'm aware yeah and it wouldn't even accomplish anything like i said like what are they even reaching for who knows anyway they'd much rather go after something that has far far worse consequences such as destroying the separation between church and state or Creating second-class citizens all over the place. Which they're working on. Um, By the way, to my knowledge, it is possible to kind of overrule Supreme Court decisions through Congress. Is that right? It depends. Okay. Um, So there are cases where the Supreme Court will be saying, Congress, you should be legislating on this. You shouldn't be making us make decisions on this. Pass a law. Or they'll say, unless there is an amendment to the Constitution, we can't rule in any other way. And so you can get Congress to pass laws. You can get Congress to pass amendments, supposedly, theoretically. And that is one way to kind of undo that. So if we wanted Roe v. Wade back, um, that was like uh, that was something that was litigated by the Supreme Court. We could have Congress write a law that perfectly represented Roe v. Wade and pass it through the House and then the Senate and then signed by the president, right? In an ideal world. Is that right? Your best bet would be an amendment because their ruling was that this is a state decision. And so if you want to make it federal business instead of state business, you're probably going to need an amendment. I'm guessing, again, just a law student here. And... If you're just going based off of popular vote, that would pass very, very quickly. But unfortunately, with the state of things as far as the actual states themselves, the makeups of the state senates and what have you, the congresses what and whatnot, it would be very, very difficult to get through at the moment. Okay. Well, let's continue. Uh, I'll tell you what. Now we have a pretty good grip on like what's going on, it seems to me. He's just trying to revive an old case that already existed that was dismissed as frivolous by filing new evidence. And what's the new evidence? Who I mean, who knows? I get we can't find that out, can we? Because is it possible to find that out what the new evidence is? If when the Supreme Court denies it, they talk about it just to make a point of how ridiculous it is and don't bother us with this. We'll find out. But honestly, I would actually be surprised if he filed anything. I mean, he probably did, but this just seems more like a political play than anything. Something to get his names, his name in the papers. Absolutely. So I I doubt we'll really hear much more on this after this news cycle is over. Yeah, I agree. He was just trying to get his name in the news and... He started something called the, uh, oh my God, the Lindell Action Fund or something to that effect. And uh, the bottom line is people can donate to it, you know, to be used by Mike Lindell to improve election integrity or whatever. I mean, it's obviously completely ridiculous, but that money has to go somewhere and he has to show his patrons that he's doing something with it, I guess. So he's probably showing them something, right? I'm guessing he's using this as a jumping off point to introduce his new podcast, Pillow Talk. (laughs) Pillow Talk. That's Oh, my God. Yes. We need that. Mike Lindell. Mike Pillow. Pillow Talk with Mike Pillow. That'd be fantastic. (laughs) That's good. I like that. Oh, God. Now I'm sad that I'm not the creator of my pillow because I can't have a podcast called Pillow Talk. Anyway, uh, check out this video of Mike Lindell. This is from, uh, hang on, I got to get the dates exactly right because these happened in succession and it was right around the same time. So this one was from mid-March 2024. The previous one was mid-March 2024. 
And then the next one is also mid-March 2024. They're all for mid-March. Then we have different dates. So check this out. And we're able to add new evidence, which just came about three months ago. This evidence is more explosive than any evidence I've seen. And I Explosive. The evidence has been drinking prune juice. Apparently so. Seen and I've seen a lot. This is uh this is gonna shock the world on Thursday. And it's uh uh Lou, I've never been more optimistic and excited. I really believe these Supreme right. Court justices, they have grandchildren, children, they have uh families and they have neighbors, and they see the destruction of our country just like they made the nine zero vote for the constitution with the Colorado keeping our great real president on the ballot. Oh, that's true. They did, didn't they? Um, Colorado basically removed Trump from the ballot. Well, that was just from the primary ballot, wasn't it? Or and, and that one was kind of complicated. Part of the reason they did that was because if Trump was removed from the ballot in Colorado, he wouldn't be eligible to run for president, period. And that would essentially be one state making rules for all the other states, which is really frowned upon. So it's more complicated and more nuanced than Mr. Pillow wants to have everyone think. OK, interesting. I didn't eat, I didn't even realize that um, that makes more sense. Like I was kind of confused by the Colorado decision, why they would like, you know, left-leaning people or reasonable people vote against Colorado um, having him on the ballot. I didn't realize it had far-reaching effects. That makes a lot more sense now. So, uh, yeah, there was a 9-0 a, a decision with the Supreme Court basically to not allow Colorado to remove Trump from the ballot. That's what he's talking about. Colorado keeping our great real president on the ballot. I believe if they accept this, this evidence is so explosive that it'll have to be another 9-0 vote. Um, I'm so excited. Oh, yeah. The evidence is so big and explosive. It has to be 9-0 because he's so well, you know, it's so important to everybody. I'm excited. And I'll tell you, we really need everybody's help, too. The only thing that can stop this, we've got to get. Oh, yeah. That was the end of the clip, I guess. Lou Dobbs tonight. He was on Lou Dobbs talking about this on Lindell TV. Boy, Lou Dobbs really fell from grace, didn't he? Anyway, the, the point here is that Lindell is like a scam artist. And fascinatingly, this is okay. This isn't the first time that Lindell has scammed people by any stretch of the imagination. This is another clip. I'm not, we're not going to watch this one, but just look at like the donation amounts he has here. Just like on his web, uh, his website here, Lindell offense fund, $24 donation. Holy, that's like, that's like a lot of money. And then the next one up is $47. Like what? Oh my God. 75, a hundred, two fifty, five hundred dollars seven hundred fifty dollars a thousand dollars or enter another amount. He is really shooting for the stars with these uh, amounts, isn't he? Anyway, I wanted to talk about like the real base idea behind what he believes about his understanding of the election and, and like where the hang up is with the voting machines and all of that stuff. The voting machines, Mike Lindell claimed in his video, Absolute Proof, he claimed that they were connected to the internet and that when they were connected to the internet, they were the votes were all changed by China, and he claimed all this crazy stuff about like he had all these graphics up on screen of all these states that were being hacked and all this ridiculous stuff. It was insane. It was just all ridiculous. So the whole thing hinges on the the idea that the voting machines are connected to the internet. If they're not connected to the internet, he's completely full of it. Like everything that he said about voting machines or counting machines or whatever. It's all fabricated nonsense, right? So listen to this clip I have here of him talking about his his device that he's got. He's pushing out to everybody. It's called a WMD leading up to the election. This clip is actually from uh, 2023. It's um, August 17th, 2023. So just listen to like his breakdown of this wireless monitoring device, WMD. 
what's really powerful is the other side here is going to know that this technology exists because it's now yeah, correct me right. if i'm wrong here but this is deeper yeah. it's not just something you can do on it because there's apps out there that can show you available wi-fi networks this yeah, is another yeah. level yeah this is a, it this doesn't doesn't matter yeah, there are apps that can show you available Wi-Fi networks. Yeah, it's called literally any device, period. And I love that these two are talking about things on the Internet and Well, you're security. a computer science major originally, right? Yeah, and I've been working on my certified ethical hacking certification type thing. So, yeah, I, I love it. Like, these people probably barely can use Facebook, and yet they're acting as though they are some kind of internet security, cybersecurity expert. Yeah, they probably call it face space. I was trying to get a good shot of the WMD here, wireless monitoring device. And believe you me, they definitely make a joke about George Bush invading Iraq on trumped up charges. Um, I can't. Oh, here, here. Yeah, here you go. Here you go. He holds up the. God, come on. Show me the WMD. It's just this little black box with like, I don't know, like plastic shielding or something. If you zoom in, you can kind of see it. I don't know what it's supposed to do. Basically, uh, from my understanding, you walk into a room at a voting machine or like a voting place or whatever. And this machine detects wireless networks and then transmits that to something. Mike Lindell's like servers. That they found a wireless network? Like, yeah, churches and schools and stuff have wireless networks. That's not surprising to anybody. I don't know what groundbreaking, like, uh, discovery he thinks he's just made with all of this stuff. We're in the information age. Everywhere you go, there's going to be a wireless network, even in, like, the park. And actually, I think even North Korea now has internet in most areas just on their own, like, separate internet. Mm. Internet is pretty widespread. It's pretty universal at this point. And Mike Lindell claiming that he's going to detect wireless uh, wireless networks. And, uh, like, what is he, is he going to say that he's, like, hacking into them? Or I don't know. Like, the dude is just so full of it. Pop up. It would pop up, ding. It would say, here's the phone. Here's the brand. Here's everything. Now, if it was a computer, here's the address. If sure. it's a voting machine, here's a router. Here's a polling book. Here's a, a printer. Okay, so the WMD, wireless monitoring device, is going to filter out phones and printers and routers and remove them from the list and will be left with voting machines, I guess, is what he's saying, right? You told us they That's weren't cool. online. Now think of this, if you're a county... You told us they're not online. They're not. They're not online. They were never online. A printer. You told us they That's weren't cool. online. Now think of this. If you're a county clerk that we always go to and say, hey, we want to get rid of these machines, and they go, no, our, our, my machines aren't online. Well, she's heard, might have heard a lie behind a lie, a, a string of lies. Well, right now, that's an unacceptable excuse now because we're going to be able to go to them clerks and go, are you really going to uh, sit back because we're going to know either you're lying, misconstrued, or you're listening to a lie. Are you sure you want to keep them? The difference with. So he's talking about going to county clerks who are responsible for voting machines. And he went to every single county clerk, including one named Tina Peters, who famously like got in all kinds of trouble for a bunch of stuff that's hilarious that I don't need to get into right now. Anyway, she got arrested publicly and she kicked at the cop. It was it was really funny. Maybe I'll insert a clip of it later. Uh, Mike Lindell went to county clerks and asked them to validate his already existing beliefs that they were online. And they're, they're just not. They're just not online. That's just what it is. So he invented the WMD and sold 100,000, 200,000 of them to, like, county clerks and, and voting, uh, po you know, poll workers and whatever, and, and to just normal people, some of them, and they're all going to go into their voting places and turn on their WMDs, and they're all, they're all going to start beeping, and that's going to be an indication that the, the the voting is all rigged. This is just insane. Like this guy's a true believer, isn't he? You think? Uh, I think he. I think he's a true believer, but also I think that he is just really desperate for money because anyone in their right mind would have told him that this isn't going to work. That that, th that everywhere has internet. That's true. I understand that he has to use money f 
donated to the Lindell Offense Fund, he has to use that for you know um, election integrity purposes. If he doesn't, it's wire fraud, right? But it, maybe he put in some kind of a little uh, addendum, like I I in the uh, document, like the the website where he gets people to donate to him. Maybe put in a little addendum that says. This money can be spent on absolutely anything that I want at any time for any reason or whatever. Like Donald Trump did that, too. It's just embarrassing. Anyway, yeah. Any final thoughts on this? No, I just I'm I hope I got everything right. I If you didn't, it'll be cut in post. OK, there we go. <laughs> anyway, tell me what you think about it in the comments. I was pretty entertained by it. Let me know how you think my wife did. I'm sure she'd be she would appreciate the feedback. And be nice, please. As always, I mean, these are my fans. They're always nice. You guys are always nice, right? Nothing to worry about. Yeah, I'm in law school, though. One negative comment will send me into the <laughs> mental break. Uh, it'll be fine. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah, let me know what you guys think in the comments, for real. I'm interested in what you have to say about this. I think this dude's, I think this dude's for real to the heart. I really do. I think all the way down, he's real. And he's also broke. Tell me what you think. Next up, I found a clip of Kenneth Copeland all the way back from the 1970s saying everybody believed he was a scam artist. Everybody he knew thought that he was scamming his congregation because they knew that he was a scumbag before. And when they found out he had this evangelical ministry or whatever, they tried to like alert the members of the ministry. It's hilarious. 1970. I've got the clip because I went through the entire thing beginning to end. Let's talk about it. And we'll talk about some of his more notorious scams. We'll be right back. Don't forget to check out my Patreon and check out my website and email list for early access to uncensored, ad-free, complete videos. All links are in the description. This fine looking young man right here is Kenneth Copeland. You may not recognize him. It's from the 1970s. I watched an episode of his sermons from the 70s. The whole thing on my unfiltered YouTube channel, Owen Unfiltered, and got a couple of really good clips from it. Hilarious stuff. So check this, just this one clip out. By the way, it's over there. If you want to watch the whole thing, Owen Unfiltered, just check it out. Listen to what he said. And most of the time, I don't feel too righteous. Whew. I remember when I first read that, I thought, who, me? <laughs> you know, there's some guys right uh, in the, uh, some parts of the state of Texas that don't believe I'm too righteous either. Whew. Man, alive after the way I lived before I got a hold of God. So the other day in Dallas, I was... See, that's what I find fascinating. Okay, great. You know what? This guy was kind of unrighteous, quote unquote, before he got a hold of God or whatever. Fine. You know, I had a hard life. I got into some bad stuff myself and I get redemption. I get that. Sure. But here's the part I found particularly fascinating. The other day in Dallas, I was at Love Field fixing to leave town on the airplane and a friend of mine was with me. In fact, he's in the studio audience here tonight. And when, when, when I put the, the check that said Kenneth Copeland Evangelistic Association over on the counter, you know, to buy the airplane ticket, the guy looked at it and he stood back a minute and he looked at me. He said, he said uh, Evangelistic Association. And I said, yeah, you know. He said, uh, he turned around to the other guy and he said, uh, are you with him? He said, yeah. He said, uh, do you know about him? <laughs> he kind of smiled. He said, yeah, I know all about him. He said, you're not telling me anything new. He said, I know something about him you don't know. So anyway, uh, Copeland pretty clearly outlines that he was like a scam artist before. And whoever this guy is that he met recognized him and knew that this was a scam and was telling this friend who I guess Copeland was with, hey, he's a scam artist. You're being scammed. Kenneth Copeland Evangelistic Ministries. This dude hasn't been like religious his entire life up to this very moment. He's been a scam artist. And now he's an evangelist? Okay. And you fell for it? I mean, that's what the heart of the clip was. So in that spirit... I wanted to look at a couple of the most hilarious, obvious scams that Kenneth Copeland ran. 
hilarious and like dark. Let's start with tithing. COVID-19 hit. This was mid-March 2020. All right. So this is about a month after COVID fully hit in the U.S. and people were taking it seriously. We knew it was here and we were masking and we were locking down and we were being careful in the whole nine yards. February 25th, give or take, is when we started taking things seriously. So this is about three weeks or so after that. And what does Kenneth Copeland say to his congregation three weeks after a worldwide pandemic comes to town? Fear of this, this coronavirus is, is faith in its ability to hurt you or kill you. Uh, <clears throat> the, 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 the fear of what are we going to do? Well, I would recommend following the suggestions of the scientific community which just so happened to be the exact same suggestions given 100 years ago, wear masks, social distance, and all that other stuff that comes with it. Get vaccinated, so on and so forth. But okay, I, I mean, I guess Kenneth, Co Kenneth Copeland has another idea. The fear of, what are we going to do? I'm getting laid off at work. Hey, your job's not your source. <laughs> Um, yes, it is. That's where you get your money. You get your money from your job. Your job pays you. Of course. If it is, you're in trouble. Jesus is your source. Jesus doesn't sign checks for me. Whatever you do right now, don't you stop tithing. Mm. Don't you stop sowing offerings. Well, they won't let us go to church. Well, email it in there, text the give or something, but you get your tithe in that church. If you have to go take it down there and drop it off and unstick it under the door or something, right, you right. get that tithe in that church, you get that offering in that church, and then you go home and you do what we're supposed to do. You're, you're seeing this, right? It's not just me. It's blatant scam artistry. How is this guy still so well respected? How is he this close to being a billionaire? I think he's got $850 million or something like that. How is it that he is so renowned in the community? That is so very obviously a scam. Here's another one. This one was from uh, 2023. It was late October 2023. Check this one out. And here's, here's the thing that you must always remember. Okay. When you don't tithe, you've got a ticking time bomb in your pocket. Yeah. Right, right. So tithing is, is top of the list. Absolutely must tithe. Must give my money to Kenneth Copeland. Totally, totally. Go on. And it'll explode right when you needed it not to. It's dangerous to keep money in your pocket instead of in Kenneth Copeland's pocket. See, he'll hold it for you. He'll hold that ticking time bomb. He'll do it for you. <coughs> Why would anyone not want to tithe? Kenneth, this may be like a new concept to you, but people want to tithe. They don't have the f***ing money for it. You ever consider the possibility that maybe not everybody is as filthy rich as you? Ever consider the possibility that even $25 is a life-changing amount of money for some people? Like, holy sh**, I can pay for gas this week. My car, I've been putting $5 in it every time I go out, and I like it's just been on the red. I have no idea how much further, what, three miles, five miles left in that car, maybe? Am I even going to make it to work? $25 in that case is a lot of money to people. And Kenneth Copeland is doing everything he can to scam the less fortunate out of what little money they have. $850 million in this guy's pocket. Well, in his repertoire, like what he owns in his, um, his, por in his portfolio or whatever. $850 million. And he's saying, why wouldn't anybody tithe? I don't understand. I don't get it. Why wouldn't anybody give money to their pastor? What's the deal? Have you figured out by now God doesn't need your money? He's doing very well. Yeah, it's Kenneth Copeland that needs his money. Or that needs their money. 
But the reason he insists on it is so that he has the opportunity to enter into our affairs and then turn around and bless us and spend it all back on us. Right. Totally. This is prosperity gospel, if you're unfamiliar. It's a mix of uh, New Age thought, kind of the law of attraction, and a number of other theological concepts. The idea is if you give money to Kenneth Copeland, give him $10, God will give you $100 back. It's illustrated pretty clearly by Andrew Womack, another scam artist that's been scamming people out of every penny that they own since before I was born, probably. Let me just show you. Let me introduce you to Andrew Womack if you don't know him. I love this clip to death, dude, because it's just so absurd. All right, just <laughs> listen to uh, uh, Andrew Womack here for a second. A friend of mine in Illinois actually knows a teacher that comes to uh, school as a furry and wears ears and a tail and uses a litter box at the front of the classroom to relieve himself. Uses a litter box at the front of the classroom to relieve himself. Really? He just said that. You know what? I, I'm not the guy always bagging on people. I will let other pastors do it for me. I'm dumber than a box of rocks in a lot of areas. Thank you, Greg Locke. I appreciate that. I, I appreciate your input on the subject. I've lived for the Lord my whole life. And I was dumb as a box of rocks and didn't know it. Shane Vaughn, too. He gets it. He knows. A friend of mine in Illinois actually knows a teacher that comes to uh, school as a furry. And where it is so stupid, I don't even know what to do with it. Anyway, that's Andrew Womack. Listen to him describe how low these people will go. I mean, Kenneth Copeland says... Why would you not want to tithe? It's a ticking time bomb, right? I want to tithe. Have you figured out by now God doesn't need your money? I mean, it's an, a very obvious scam. And it's laid out pretty clearly, in my opinion, in this video from Andrew Womack, which came out February 9th, 2023. Just listen to a second or two of this. When you receive an offer and people think, well, you're just wanting money for yourself. You know, I don't care whether you give or not. God Is that so? You don't care whether you give or not, huh? God's going to take care of me, I promise you. My needs are bigger than what you can meet. Well, what a single individual can meet, yeah. But when you convince the entire congregation and also everybody watching, what is that, uh, 20, 30, 40,000 people? watching and there and who will eventually watch, I don't know, 100,000? Who knows? When you convince each of those people to give you $5 even, or $100, or hell, at least some of them, $1,000? That is a lot of money, bro. And he knows that. He's trying to gloss right over the fact that people in large numbers can donate massive amounts of money to him. Just pretend that, like, he doesn't even need their money. I have to have, I just figured out this week, I have to have $11,000 an hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days out of the year. Is that so? $11,000 an hour, huh? What is this? This is, uh, I wish they'd put commas in. That'd make things a lot easier. So you're telling me he needs, he, he needs $96 million a year to run his business? Is that, is that what you're telling me? He's a part of Kenneth Copeland Ministries. What are his expenses? He has a contract with him. He uses, like, Kenneth Copeland Ministries studios, doesn't he? 165 days out of the year. You are not my source. God is my source. No, they are. They are his source. They are where he gets his money. Now, God may be inspiring them to give. I don't believe that for a second, but okay, whatever. They are the source. But you need to give. You need to participate. I was ministering on this exact passage of Scripture in Greg's church. And there was a woman that came up during the, uh, during the altar call. And she said, do you remember me? And I didn't remember her. But it, she, she reminded me that the previous year, she was let out of a mental institution to come to church on a Sunday. Okay, the very last 
place a mental institution should ever allow a patient to go. And by the way, what mental institutions still exist? I thought Reagan closed almost all of them. Do we have any, like, around still? I thought most were, like, psych wards in hospitals. And they were, like, short-term type of deal, right? You know, it's a little thing, but I'm just saying, like... I don't trust a word out of the guy's mouth. Like, not one. I think the guy's lying. You can tell he's lying when his lips are moving, in my opinion. So I prayed with her, and when I came back the next year, she was, she was no longer a patient. And so she came up and said, do you remember me? And I didn't remember her. And she says, they let me out, but I'm the janitor at this mental institution. And she had a room that was supplied to her, so she was still in the nut house. <laughs> and she said, I want a different job and a different place to live so that I can get out of there. And she says, I need some money. And I had just taught on this passage of Scripture. So she was asking the church for help. Honestly, that's what churches are there for. When I was little, told this story before, my parents were broke as it gets. They had nothing. Filed bankruptcy. We moved to West Virginia. We lived in a hotel for a short time. I don't even know how we paid for that hotel. We were broke as it gets. And we asked the congregation, the local congregation, for help. And you know what they did? They all got together and they brought canned goods over and they helped us find a house to rent they bought me school supplies. They bought me a backpack to bring to school the, for the following year. They bought me colored pencils and crayons and notebooks and loose leaf paper and binder, the whole thing. They gave my parents thousands of dollars and a budget and everything. That's the benefit of a church. That's the benefit of community right there, to have somebody who can help you with that. And I, it, it sounds to me like that's what she was asking for, for help with that. He's a mega church pastor. How much money does this guy have? How much is he worth? He said it takes a hundred million dollars a year to run his business earlier. I don't believe that, but okay. I'm assuming what he meant to say is he makes a hundred million dollars a year, but okay, let's, uh, let's keep listening. So what did he do when she said, I need help? I have nothing left and I have nowhere to go, but you know, and I, I have no idea how to get out of this rut that I'm in. What, did he, what was his response? ...that I shared with you. So I said, what do you have? And she made the connection. She knew what I was going to do. So she went and got her purse, and she had a little coin purse, and she counted it out, and it was something like $78.35, something like that. And I said, give it to me. And she said, all of it? And I said, all of it. <laughs> and I took my hands like this, and I took every penny that that woman had. She said that she wasn't going to get paid for a week, and she didn't have groceries. And I said, give me all of it. And I know many of you think typical preacher. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I do. 100%. Typical preacher taking every penny. And the crowd in the background is laughing. He's made a joke out of it. Typical preacher. Hilarious. That is so very funny. Typical preacher after everything that people own. But you know what happened? Greg called me the next week. And okay, I don't know who Greg is or what his connection is. And it turned out that that was on a Sunday morning. On Monday, a person who didn't go to that church, didn't know what was happening, gave her a car. Okay, well, if they didn't know what was happening and were completely unaffiliated, do you think that maybe that was just of their own free will? Maybe they just wanted to give her a car? And also, um, I'm sorry, man. I just, like, I don't believe a word out of his mouth. I can tell he's lying when his lips are moving. Car. It wasn't a brand new car, but it was a good car and just gave her a car. And on Wednesday, her mother had kind of been estranged from her since she was having these mental problems and had not contacted her in a long period of time. And I Okay, it seems like that's when you should have... A mother close to you the most right if my kid was having mental problems i'd be right there every second of every minute of every hour of every day i'd be right there to help her figure out her way through it okay this mother decided to stop talking to her kid go on and out of the blue she just called on wednesday 
and the lady told her that she had been released from the hospital for a year and that she was now doing good. And the mother apologized and said, would you move back in with me? So she got her place to live, plus got her relationship with her mother restored. And, and who gave her all those things? Other people. People affiliated with the church in one way or another. Oh, and by the way, he's hearing about all of this like second hand or third hand, right? Greg said that he spoke to somebody who said, blah, blah, blah. is this even real? Is any of this real? It wouldn't surprise me in the least bit to find that he did take $78 and like 36 cents or something from somebody who didn't have food for another week. $25 can change somebody's life for real, can change their whole month. $25 can be the difference between eating and not eating or eating rice and eating sandwiches. It's shameless that a hundred millionaire is taking $78 and 30 something cents from some random woman who has nothing. Kenneth Copeland told us who he was back in 1971, I think, or, or maybe it was 1970. He told us who he was. Everybody knew. Everybody in Texas was fully aware that he was a scam artist. Andrew Womack is a scam artist, just like his friend Kenneth Copeland. By the way, Andrew Womack is on Kenneth Copeland's network. They work together. Kenneth Copeland now owns the Victory Channel, and Andrew Womack is on the Victory Channel. By Friday, she had a job that was paying her twice as much as she was making in the mental institution. I bet. And how much was that? What, did she go from seven twenty-five an hour to 14 an hour or something like that? I mean, is any of this even real? People's lives are being changed. This is fertile ground. And if you need the power of God, the blessing... All you have to do is give me money. If you need the power of God, the blessing of God, give me money. It's just a joke, dude. These people are blatant scam artists. They were from the beginning. How do people fall for this? You know, I, I can't throw stones here. I fell for some stupid stuff myself. It's not like, it's not idiots that fall for this stuff. It's people who have been preyed upon it's people who have been victimized by them who've been convinced through undue influence to give everything they own over to this people like people like this like weasels absolutely shameless and after all these years he's still doing it to this day so this is a uh, late march 2020 i think this is like um, a month and a half after COVID-19 was taking place and people were talking about a vaccine. They're trying to develop a vaccine. The, there was like there was talk of an mRNA technology company producing this vaccine as quickly as they could. And what does Kenneth Copeland say to that? It no more. is finished. finished. He commanded COVID-19 was over. And the United States of America. You know, he's a pocket square man. I can appreciate that. Is healed you, and well Thank you. again. And that was March, late March 2020, or I think, uh, somewhere in that vicinity. And the nation is healed again. Do you know that Donald Trump called for a national day of prayer when COVID started? This is from Hemant Mehta, a uh, friendly atheist, Hemant Mehta. Writing the, um, the foreword to my book, by the by. Check my book out if you want to get a copy. owenmorgan.com slash book. Anyway, National Day of Prayer, March 15th, 2020. Boom, right here. And look at that gigantic leap in COVID deaths and COVID cases. National Day of Prayer didn't seem to do for anybody, huh? Weird. Almost like he was lying the whole time. Almost like he was a scam artist the whole time. After saying he commanded that a vaccine come immediately, shortly thereafter, he comes out with this one right here. This is um, mid-September 2021. The time has come Hallelujah. for ministries, particularly traveling ministries, 
to have some other weapon method of travel. Yes, sir. God, he is obsessed with the fact that he wants an airplane. He deserves an airplane uh, of his own that he owns and that traveling ministries should have airplanes of their own, too. Other weapon method of travel. Yes, sir. Other than the airlines. That's right, yes, sir. Agreed. Uh, you get into this situation, we're not going to let you fly unless you're vaccinated. Right. Well, to me, that's the mark of the beast. Well, it sounds to me like you're not flying then, huh? You're driving or you're <laughs> taking a boat. That's how it works when we're in the middle of a pandemic. And by the way, there's a story about a guy that got vaccinated 217 times in Germany. You'd think that cases like this would be like they would instantly disprove the claims made by the far right, but somehow they don't. They they satirize it. They laugh about it. Oh, this guy. Oh, I bet he's all messed up. Are you kidding me? The dude's alive and well. He's fine. As a matter of fact, scientists asked if they could study him, and he said, "Yeah, as long as you give me another vaccine." <laughs> Seems to be addicted to him. He got a, like one or no, he got two a week. Since they became available, pretty much. 217. Too many vaccines is bad for you. It causes immune immune system fatigue, something to that effect. There's a, like a, a, a logarithmic scale as a detrimental effect, basically, the more you get. You really shouldn't get more. As it turns out, actually, 217 vaccines was more beneficial than just the normal, like, three or four. Not by much. A little. It's certainly not worth it to get 217. I don't think anybody would recommend that. But the vaccine didn't kill, like, nearly anybody. Pretty much nobody who was adversely affected by the vaccine. Oh, and also, it wasn't the mark of the beast. Okay? Get over yourself. God, these people are so self-absorbed. Everything is about them. Everybody's out to get them. Completely shameless. And I honestly... Truthfully, I can't believe that people fell for the grift all the way back in 1970 when it was like plain as day that he was just a scam artist the whole time. There's some guys right uh, in the, uh, some parts of the state of Texas that don't believe I'm too righteous either. Whew. Tell me what you think about it in the comments. Dude has been a scam artist since, from, since the beginning, seems to me. Let me know your thoughts. That's all I've got for you. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, don't forget to check me out on Patreon. And take a look at my YouTube channels. Owen Morgan, where I talk about religious issues. Telltale Fireside Chat, where I talk about politics. Telltale Unfiltered, where I do long-form breakdowns of stuff like this. And Telltale Reads, where I read books by televangelists and others. I release everything in parts, but every part stands independently of the last. So you can jump in anywhere and I'll make sure it makes sense. You can find some ad-free, uncensored, complete versions of all my videos on my website, owenmorgan.com. And while you're there, don't forget to sign up for my email list to get early access to everything. All links are in the description. Okay, thanks for watching, guys.